Right, how's it going everybody? This is is Morta and this morning during my Saturday 9 a.m. Central board game stream I'd be showing you some how to play Munchkin Critical Role. Uh, this, if you saw my previous stream uh, a few weeks ago, I did an unboxing and be able to, and show you in detail what you get out of the game. Whereas today, what I'm going to focus on is not showing you all the pretties, but just showing you step by step how you play the game and audio, an audible of how to play the game, if you will. And I'll show you obviously um, different components as we're going over how to play the game. An example at the end of how to play as well. Um, and definitely, if you like what you see, be sure to catch up my, all, uh, my other streams, which are normally um, Saturdays at 9 Central for board games and Sunday 9 Central for video games. And you catch out on twitch.tv slash ismorta. And VODs you'll be able to find on Twitch as well as on YouTube at Shadow Balance Games. And if you want to see the latest on schedule updates and what content's going to be for the upcoming week, be sure to check out Twitter at Shadow Balance. All right, let me just uh, check the sound right quick and we will get a rockin'. Testing, one, two, three. All right, we are good. Let me bring up the chats. Cool. All right, so let's get into it. All right, so what I'm gonna do to keep it simple and so you can reference different parts is I'm gonna actually just read the rules here and then we're gonna illustrate what you what we're talking about as we do it. All right. Alexa, I'll have an example combat at the end. Because really this game is all about the basics, which I saw here somewhere, which is really right here. Like, honest to God, like this is the game step by step, is like classic Munchkin. You kick open the door, you fight the monster, then you grab treasure, and then you're trying to reach level 10 to win. That's the game steps in a nutshell. But what this game adds is some optional ways you can play Munchkin to make it feel more like you're playing Critical Role. What you get into, um, this to spice it up with your optional modes. And of course, uh, this game, you can also mix it with other Munchkin sets as well. All right, so. Set up the game. Three to six players can play. Divide the cards into the door and treasure decks. You can tell because even though there's a lot of different types of cards of different types, the backs are sorted into um, door and treasure. So uh, I'm not going to shuffle it. Uh, with, with, obviously that's what you normally do just because I want to be able to reference certain types of cards to uh, sh show example what they're referring to but there's a lot of different types of cards which we'll go into for each um, deck type that have different things that happen depending on what deck you're drawing from and so you definitely want to shuffle it and then you have two decks uh, shuffle both decks and deal four cards from each deck to each player so let's say the minimum was three players. So let's say we got Yasha, uh, Caleb, and Ford. Let's see so you can see. Um, it said deal four cards from each deck to each player. So I'm just going to do a for instance, but obviously it's going to be shuffled. I'm just, I just want to keep these organized so that I can uh, be able to show cards. So 
So each one gets four of those. Then each one will get four, you know, four, four. So this allows each player to have four of things they can do and four of things they can encounter. So you can equip your guys initially with this stuff or have stuff to play. And these are things you're trying to do and utilize to go after. Cool. And so each player would have eight cards. Then deal one character card random each player. I, I'll see, I, I think dealing at random is kind of dumb because if you're playing the game, you most likely want to be a character that you want to play as. So if anything, I recommend deal a few cards and choose one out of two or one out of three. Hey, what's up, Nacris? Um, just because that's kind of dumb. Like if you really want to play some type of character or a certain couple characters and you don't have that option. So do what's ever fun. It's all about the fun. All right, so card management, door and treasure decks. Place the door and treasure decks face down the middle of the table. For instance, we'll just put it here. Like I said, like this game, like it is just a card game. It just has two decks. And you kick down the door, get stuff, or lose or fail getting stuff. That is like the game in a gist. Um, keep separate face up discard piles with the two decks. Do not look through the discard unless you play a card that allows you to do so. So that's very interesting. I thought previous Munchkin you could always see the discard pile, but unless I've been playing wrong. So when you discard from either one, they go face down. Um, door and treasure decks. We already did that. Uh, cards in play. These are the cards on the table in front of you showing your roll and drive, if any. Uh, roll and drive are particular types of cards. For example, these are rolls, like you can be a rogue or you can be a priest. Those are a roll you play. And then a drive is uh, kind of like DD, like why your character is part of the party. Like why are you adventurer? It's like, are you trying to protect people? Or are you, uh, you know, out for blood? So, so that's what I mean by roll and drive. Um, guest stars work with you and items you're carrying. Guest stars would be um, literally characters that guest starred on the show or NPCs that Matt played as. For example, uh, Shikasta. Um, that's uh, an example of a guest star. And then, let's see, uh, and any items you're carrying, that's like, for example, a chromatic orb is an item, what it looks like. So in front of you, let's say we're playing, all right, so we already did an example of what it looks like, right? Blah. Whole point is to show how to play. All right, so, so like I said, like if you're Ford, then you might have, actually, you know what? I'll show the example right here. Like for example, if you're not the Brave, level one, let's say, you can place stuff in front of you, say like, oh, I have these items. And you could say, I have this guest star and, I have, and I'm a fighter. So these are all cards played in front of you. And this shows your level. Persistent curses and some other cards also stay on the table after you play them. All cards in play must be visible to other players. So like if you have any penalties, which we'll get into that. Your hand. Cards in your hand are not in play. They don't help you, but they can't be taken away except by cards that can't specifically affect your hand. At the end of your turn, you may have no more than five cards in your hand. So you can have as many cards in your hand, but at the end of your turn, you can only have five. Which is honestly good, because if you have too many cards, it just gets cumbersome. Um, like, it's funny how typically, like, Parkinson's stuff, so you can have seven, but even that's, you know, a lot. So it, that's a really good way to play. Um... Less is sometimes more. 
Okay, so character creation. Each member of the Mighty Nine, which if you're not familiar with the Mighty Nine, it's the group of heroes. They're, they're, the name of the group is the Mighty Nine. Nine meaning uh, no in German, not uh, the number nine. Even though if you watch the show, you know they play around with that fact and, the, and kind of use it interchangeably all the time. Um, as well. Uh, look at your starting eight cards. Each, each member of the 99 starts at level one. Each with special abilities as described in a character card. Like for example, not special ability is here, drinking solution. Uh, look at your starting eight cards. You have, if you have any roll or drive cards, like I had shown earlier, you may, if you like, play one of each by placing them in front of you. Um, if you have any usable items or guest star cards, you may play them by placing them in front of you. If you have any doubt about whether you should play a card, you, sh you could read on, or you could just go ahead and do it. Note the character cards are double-sided. The special abilities are the same on both sides, and either side may be used. Yeah, like I mentioned before, the difference in each side is just the, the character progression actually during the campaign, but they gave the same um, ability, which like I mentioned before, I think it's kind of stupid. That was really a great point that you could have given another ability that matches what the person was doing in the game, but what have you. For ba balancing wise, I'm sure it's a nightmare to introduce twice as many abilities, probably. All right. So, turn phases. Uh, your turn begins as soon as the previous player's turn ends. And it is broken up into a number of phases. First, equip and arrange your cards in the way you want. Then go to phase one, which is kick open the door. Uh, kick open the door. That's, like I said, that's the phase. Uh, where's the example I showed? Uh, first phase, kick, kick open the door. Uh, draw the top card from the door deck and turn it face up. So, for example, uh, did I just mix both decks? I just said I wouldn't do that, and I just did that. No, I didn't mix both decks. Good deal. Okay, so for example, if you kick open the door, you take the top card and you put it in play. Um, if it is a monster, you must fight it, and we'll look at combat later. If it is a curse, it applies to you immediately and is discarded unless it has a persistent effect or you keep the card as a reminder of an upcoming effect. If you draw any other card, roll, drive, monster, enhancer, etc. Like in this case, it's a roll card. Uh, you may either put it in your hand or play it immediately if you want to, and it is legal to do so. Uh, the next phase is look for trouble or loot the room. So... If you knock, if you knock down the door, well, in this case, kick open the door, and it was a monster, like in like in this case, for example, of a monster. Uh, then you would do combat and fight it to then get out of this phase. So this phase is kick open the door. You either get something or you have to fight something, and then that's the end of the phase. The next phase is look for trouble or loot the room. So you quick open the door. If you if if it's a, if there's no item, you instantly go to three. If it's combat, you go to two. For example, all right. So you either look for trouble or loot the room. So if you fought a monster in phase one, you instead you uh, go to phase three. If you did not draw a monster when you kicked open the door, and you have you have two choices, either to look for trouble or loot the room. So if you want to look for trouble, uh, that means you can play a monster card from your hand. Remember, you when you're playing the, the game, you drew four uh, door cards, and one of them could be a monster. And so you could choose, if you didn't find a monster, when you kicked open the door, you could play a monster. Um, if you play a monster from your hand and fight it, 
just as if you had fought it by kicking open the door. Don't play a monster you can't handle unless you think you can get some help. And we'll go into that. And that's something you can do in the game, which we'll get into later. Um, and then if you don't want to look for trouble, you can instead loot the room. If you don't have a monster you want to fight, you can draw a second card from the door deck face down and place it in your hand. So again, this is the door deck. To kick, kick the door, this means you put it into play. When you put it into play, if it's a monster, let's say it was the Hydra, you have to fight it. But if you drew a card that was not a monster, you could take it in your hand or you can immediately play it. And then you have a choice that you can either fight a monster in your hand, like let's say Oban, or you could choose to draw another card from the top of this deck that immediately goes into your hand, which could be a monster or an item or God knows what. So you only immediately have to do it when you first uh, draw from the top of the deck. Otherwise, it's you can play something from your hand or draw a card to put into your hand. All right. Um, and then uh, charity, which is uh, the third phase. Uh, if you have more than five cards in your hand, you must play enough cards to get your get you to five or below. For instance, if you play curses, sell items, or whatever, you have to reduce your hand. If you cannot reduce your hand to five cards, or you do not want to, you must give excess cards to the player with the lowest level. So that's really huge. So like if you have much cards in your hand, you need to do stuff. If you don't do anything, it's not that they're discarded, they go to the weakest player. And then if players are tied for lowest, it's divided up. But if you're tied for the lowest player, then you discard the excess. So example, if, if Not and Jester are tied for level one and you have seven cards in your hand, then two cards would go to Jester, the other one's discarded. Or one and two, whatever. The half that would go to you, you don't keep. Okay, so character stats. Um, your character, in addition to the character card itself, is basically a collection of guest stars, weapons, armor, and items, and you have three key stats, your level, your role, and your drive. Your level is here, your role, for example, fighter, and drive, um, for example, uh, vengeance. Um, so what is a level? When the rules or cards refer to your level, they mean the number. You gain a level when you defeat a monster or when a card says you do. You cannot also sell items to buy levels. You lose a level when a card says you do. Your level can never go below one. So again, this is your level. You use this to mark it, which is pretty clever because you can highlight it and then you can still see the number. So you start with one, you win the game if you get to level 10. Um, role. Players may either be a rogue, fighter, priest, or mage. So again, these are role cards. Um, each role has special abilities shown on the card. You gain the abilities of a role the moment you play its card in front of you and lose them as you discard that card. Some role abilities are powered by discards. Unless the card specifies, you may discard any of your cards in play or in your hand to power a roll ability. You may discard a roll card at any time, even in combat. I don't want, to, for example, you say I don't want to be a fighter instead, I want to be a rogue. Uh, drive. Again, this is an example of what a drive card looks like. Characters may be motivated by one of four drive cards, freedom, protection, vengeance, or redemption. Um, if you get Critical Role and Driven, which 
show an example of that. I get my critical roll. Of course, I don't know if, oh, here we go. So what this talks about in the rules is if you get critical, uh, critical roll and driven. So critical roll is a roll, haha. -ha, driven is a uh, drive. Uh, these cards may be played whenever it is legal to play a roll or drive, as long as you have an appropriate card to attach it to. You cannot have more than one of the same roll or drive card in play at once. If you play critical roll with one roll, you get all the advantages of being that roll. Monsters with penalties against the roll suffer those penalties and none of the disadvantages. If the roll has an ability that has a cost, you must still pay it because you aren't that critical. Uh, if you play crit critical role while you have two roles, you have all the normal advantages and disadvantages of both roles. So basically, uh, what these cards allow you to do is to have two roles or two drives. Otherwise, you can only have one at a time for each. Um, guest star. Show example of that. Guest star, like, um, for example, here's a uh, user, guest star. Guest stars, you may have one guest star accompanying your character. So again, that means you can only have one drive. You can only have, let's review. We can have one of, you can only have one roll, one drive, and one guest star. But you can choose to swap them out and replace them. Um, when you draw a guest star, either face up or face down, you may play it immediately or keep it in your hand to play later at any time, even during combat. While in play, your guest star may grant you combat abilities or special abilities. You can choose to play a new guest star and discard the old one whenever you like as well but you may not trade a guest star away to another player. So that's really important to note that playing a guest star, you could play it almost like a, uh, an instant in magic, for example. So you, you, you could play it as an equip and do it during your turn, but you could also play it during someone else's turn or during combat to immediately change what, whatever effects you have going on. Like for example, this one says, um, give plus one to a mage. So someone may think you're a certain value, and if not, let's say it was a mage, oh, well now you're a plus one mage. Meaning you're affecting this in battle, which we'll get into, which is your level plus any of your, your bonuses. Um, guest star says can be sacrificed to allow automatic escape for you from all monsters in a combat. Now that's really cool because one of the things that was really rough with uh, the core Munchkin game is you always had a roll of a dice and you had to get like a uh, four or better or something, or maybe it was six, I can't remember. You had to roll a particular number in order to evade penalties and, and try to run away from a monster instead of, instead of uh, losing to it. And here, if you have a guest star, it's like you can sacrifice it that that person dies instead of you. Pretty interesting. Because normally when you lose to a monster, which you get into, bad things happen. But you could choose to run away so bad stuff doesn't happen. Uh, if someone was helping you in combat, you can even decide whether or not your helper automatically escapes when you sacrifice a guest star. The choice is yours. Um, here it says a little blurb. Well, actually, the, the blurbs I'll do as reviews at the end. No, I'll skip that for now. I'll, I'll, I'll continue describing the stuff in the game. We'll go back to that. Uh, treasure cards include both permanent and one-shots, as well as some special cards not considered items. So again, the treasure cards, or anything with this back, and it includes your rolls, your drives, items, one shots, and guest stars.
any treasure may be played as soon as you get it, or at any time on your own turn, except during combat. So again, <gasps> wait a minute. So, so this little discrepancy I found here. So like everything with this back is a treasure. Treasures you can play any time except during combat. Except your guest star, which is a treasure, you can play during combat. So important distinction there, but that's it. I would do the distinctions when you can play stuff at the end because that's really the most confusing. Not seeing what stuff is, but what is the timing of stuff. Honestly, game design wise, it would have been good if you had a little flag or icon on the cards so that it just tells you by the icon when you can play stuff. Like if you see, you know, swords clashing or an item picture so that we can see what phases you can play the card, that would have been a good game design um, quality of life. That way you don't have to remember. You can just look at the card and it tells you when you can play it. Because even this was confusing, because this says that you do one thing, but then you do the other. Anyway, um, all items you have, in, um, items, most treasures are items. All items have a gold piece value. Um, so tr items you cannot play during combat. All items you have in play are considered carried. Items that are currently giving you a bonus or some other benefit are equipped. You should indicate items that are not equipped by turning the card sideways. So that, what that's saying is you can play as many item cards as you want. I'll just throw a bunch down. Um, but you can only have uh, equipped stuff that you can actually wear. And all you can wear is at one time one headpiece, one armor, one foot gear, and then you can have one weapon, whether it's a one-handed or a two-handed. So like, let's say you have all this shit here, for example. Um, I can have one foot, and you can see in the upper left what it is. Let me show you an example. In the upper left-hand corner here, that symbol shows the type of thing, like in this case it's an equipment. For this example, you see a foot, so it's a foot gear. See, there you have one armor, one foot gear, one weapon, one headpiece. So in this case, you say, oh, look, I have a weapon, a foot gear, an armor, but I have three head pieces, which you can't equip three at a time, but you can have it out. Um, it's because you can use it in the game for stuff like turning for gold. So you, in that case, you would turn sideways the ones you're not using and say, oh, I'm gonna use the, the goggles of night vision. You may not alter the status of your items during combat or, or while running away. So make sure you're happy with what you have equipped before entering combat. Anyone can carry any item. Um, but there are limits to what you can be equipped and actively use. Some items have icons to, to identify their types, like I had already displayed. Unless you have a card that lets you ignore these limits, such as guest star or cheat. Um, or a card that says so. If you're carrying two headgear cards, you can only have one equipped. You cannot discard item cards just because you may sell items for a level. So for example, like we were talking about before, you can, at the end of your turn, it forces you to discard cards, but you can't just choose to discard stuff you have in play. You have to sell it. Or something has to happen to it. Um, you may sell items for a level, trade items with other players, or give an item to another player who wants it. 
You may discard items to activate some special abilities, and a curse or a monster's bad stuff may force you to get rid of something. So that's one reason why it might be good to have extra items. That way, if you have to lose something, you don't lose something that you are actually depending on. Uh, trading, or like I said, you could you could discard items for gold. Like if you need a thousand gold to go up a level, um, in this case, you could discard these three, 400, 200, and 300. Uh, is that bad math? It is. So that's only 900 gold. And let's say and sacrifice my goggles. You could turn this all in for one level. Um, trading. You may trade items, but no other cards with other players. So you can't trade cards that are an ability, a curse, a special, a one shot, a guest star. You can only trade items. You may trade only. You may only trade items from the table, not from your hand. You may trade at any time except when you are trading partner is in combat. Um, you also give items away without a trade. Either you're trying to bribe players to get someone to do something you want. Like, I'll give you the head headband of intellect if you won't help the priest fight the lost. Um, and, and those are binding if you say you're going to do that and, and, and they meet the condition. Uh, one shots. So one shots again are, what, do, 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 what is a one shot? Like here is, so it's interesting to call it one shot because the critical role channel does also do one shots of, you know, like a, Meaning a a, a a single stream um, experience as opposed to watching a campaign of multiple streams. Uh, but I just think it's clever because it's a... Uh, what this referred to is the fact that you can only use this card once and then it goes away. L like a magic card. In, in, in magic. Well, that's not a good example. Like playing a spell, a sorcery. Uh, one shots are treasure card that says usable once only is considered a one shot item. Many of these are used during combat to strength, strengthen the munchkins or the monsters. Some have other effects, however, so read the card carefully. Discard these cards as soon as the combat is over or their effect is resolved. One shots may be played directly from your hand. One shots that are items may also be carried and played from the table or sold for levels just like other items. And that's only if the one shot is an item. Like for example, this one shot is a wand of smiles and it has a gold value. So really what the words should have said is if something has a gold value, that's the only stuff you can trade. You can only trade gold. Again, that, that's a more rules explanation clarity is they could have just said anything with gold is the only thing you can trade. Um, Other treasure cards, like go up a level, are not items. Most of these cards say when they can be played and whether they can stay in play or can be discarded. I won't go any more into that. There are treasure cards and then there are item cards. Only stuck with gold can you trade and items cannot be played in combat. But some of these other Treasure cards, like for example, uh, guest stars, you can do during combat. Selling items for levels. At any point during your turn, except during combat or running away, you may discard items worth a total of at least a thousand gold pieces to go up a level. If you sell items worth more than that, you don't get change. But if you turn in 2,000 gold worth, for example, you can go up two levels. And you can sell items from your hand as well as what you're carrying. Uh, but you cannot sell items to get to level 10. So you can sell levels to, you can sell gold anywhere that you own to gain as many levels as you want, but you have to earn level 10. Okay, so now we're getting into combat. A monster 
enters combat against you if you when you find it when you kick open the door or play it from your hand to look for trouble. To resolve combat, simply compare the monster's combat strength to yours. Your combat strength is equal to your level plus any bonuses or penalties received from roll abilities, drives, items, guest stars, or curses. The short is you you play you have the character's level, which says let's say level four, and then there's a monster. I should not be mixing this up because I did that for a reason. That was kind of stupid. <laughs> that was kind of stupid. Anyways. Uh, man, that was kind of stupid. I did that for a reason. Shit. One sec. Shit. God damn. Ugh, trying to find a fucking monster. I'm gonna need later. Christ. One sec. Compare, so the, the, the short is you compare the level of your character with the monster. If your combat strength is equal to your level plus your combat, sorry, your combat strength is equal to your level plus any bonuses, you and other players may also play one shots to use your character abilities to help or harm you in combat and you can play cards that you have to say you can play it to increase your level or decrease levels of yourself or the monster. Your, com your uh, combat strength can be negative if, if you get hit by a curse or suffer some other penalty. A monster's combat strength is its level plus wh whatever modifies it. If a if monster's combat strength is equal to yours or greater, you lose the combat. So you can't be equal to it like, for example, I have to have a level 9 or better to be a level 8. If the monster strength is equal to yours or greater, you lose combat, and then you have to either run away... And, and you have to run away, and we'll get that sect that what happens if you run away, or if you don't, and then bad stuff happens. Uh, if a combat strength is greater than monsters, you defeat it and go up a level. Sometimes two, depending on if it's a big monster, it'll tell you. You'll also get the number of treasures shown on the monster card. So treasures in the bottom right. So in this case, you would get two, two treasures. It's a level eight. And the ability you see below, bad stuff, is if you uh, get defeated by the monster and cannot run away. Bad stuff happens. So whenever you do any combat, it's either you get stuff or you lose stuff. It's never, oh, I didn't do anything during my turn. It's either a positive or a negative. Uh, if you defeat a monster, discard them and any other cards played and claim your rewards. Um, note that someone can play a hostile card on you or use a special power just as you think you have one. When you're about to defeat a monster, you must wait a reasonable time to allow people to play stuff. It's just like in Magic, like if you're going to play a, a creature card, you can't immediately tap it or use an ability. You have to give people time to react. And that goes with everything you do. It's like a typical card game. So if I play this... See if anyone's going to do anything, then play something, see if anyone's going to do anything. Because it's not fair saying like, oh, if I play cards fast enough, someone can't. Or if I resolve the combat fast, someone won't have time to play a card to screw over my combat. You have to give people the opportunity to do so. Which is normally a couple seconds. And again, when you uh, defeat the monster, you get a level. 
unless it says you get multiple levels, which is probably a boss monster, I would imagine. Monsters. If drawn face up during the kick down the door phase, monsters immediately attack the person who drew them. If you get a monster card any other way, it goes to your hand. Unless you have wandering monster that you can play during someone else's turn. And then there's cards called monster enhancers that can make raise or lower a monster's abilities. Um, if you're doing wandering monster, I'll show you an example of that. What that basically allows you to allows to happen, similar to drive and and uh, critical driven and critical role, it allows multiple monsters to be in fighting at the same time, which are additive. For example, exa English, here is wandering monster. And I'll read this to you. The monster joins the one already in combat, adding its strength. If the player or players must flee, resolve the runaway attempts separately in the order each player chooses, suffering the bad stuff for each failed attempt. So when you add monsters together, not only is there total additive, but if you lose, then there's um, you do all the negatives, but they're done as separate events, meaning that you could possibly run away from one monster and encounter another monster. Um, asking for help. If you cannot defeat a monster on your own, you may ask other players to help you. If the first player refuses, you may ask another player and so on until they all turn you down if someone helps. Only one player can help you and you can add that player's combat strength to yours. So if I think that I may have played wrong before. I think I thought before that you could have multiple people add on to try to suck stuff from you but to give you your level so that's good to know um anyone can play cards to affect your combat however but only one person can help you in quotes meaning they add their combat strength to yours and it says here you'll probably have to bribe someone to help you may offer your helper any items you're carrying or any number of treasure cards the monster is worth. And again, it's, it, it's binding. So if you bribe someone at any point in the game to trade stuff, or if you say, hey, I will give you stuff if you, give, if you help out, if you assist me in this battle, it, it's binding. And it says here though, if you, you offer your helper part of the monster's treasure, you must agree which of you gets first pick. Uh, you may also offer to play any cards from your hand that you legally could. Such as, such as get someone to go up a level. If someone successfully helps you defeat the monster, discard it, draw treasures, and follow any special instructions on the monster card, you level up for each monster defeated in combat. Your helper, though, does not go up in levels. They just get whatever they agree to in order to help you. And only one person can help someone. But anybody can play any cards that they have if they're able to play cards. Help just means that one player can add their combat strength to your total value. A few cards and abilities allow you to compel other another player to help you in combat. Um, yeah. Okay. Almost at the end, and then I'll show you some alternate rules and then example of combat, which is pretty self-explanatory because we kind of already illustrated that already. Okay, rewards. When you defeat a monster, you can go up one level per monster. So, for example, if you did a wandering monster and you fought two monsters, then you can go up two levels. Um, you also get all its treasure. Sweet. 
each monster has a treasure icon, which I showed you. Draw that many treasure cards, which again, this is the treasure deck. And again, this is the kick the, down the door deck, which has those other, which has stuff you can get as well as Mama Monster. Okay. Running away and bad stuff. So if a monster defeats you, if nobody will help you or if someone tries to help and others interfere, you still cannot win, you must run away. You don't get any levels or treasure if you run away and you can't loot the room. To run away, you roll a six sided die. You, you, you successfully run away on a five or more. So that's when you use this die. In this case, I would have failed. If you fail to run away from a monster, it does bad stuff to you, um, as described on the card. If you have to flee from multiple monsters, you have to roll for each separately. If two players are cooperating, they both have to try to escape, otherwise they'll lose. Okay, curses. Let me show you an example of curses. I think it's in this one. So here's like your curse example. It says, smile about. Um, curses, if drawn face up during kicked open the door phase, applies to the player who drew it. Uh, if cards some other way, such as looting the room, curse cards go in your hand and can be played on any player at any time. Usually a curse affects its victim immediately if it can and is then discarded. However, some curses have a penalty later in the game or have a persistent effect. Persistent cursed cards may not be discarded to power any roll abilities. Do I'm affected by a curse already. Um, if someone plays a your next fight curse on you while you're in combat, it counts in that combat. Because the next combat is the next one you encounter, which can be the, cert the current combat that you're in, is what the rules say. If a curse can apply to more than one item, the victim decides which item is affected. One reason why it's good to have multiple items. If a curse applies to something you don't have, ignore it. All right, so now, yeah, awesome. So we're, so we're at, we're great. <clears throat> I'll go, go over uh, death first, and then I'll show combat, and then alternate ways that you can play the game. Which make a thematic. Okay, so death. If you ever die in the game, you lose all your stuff. Um, okay, let me read stuff one second. There's one thing that doesn't make any sense. I see. It depends on the bad stuff. So normally, when you lose a combat, you have to again. You have to run away, or bad stuff happens. If bad stuff happens, the only bad stuff that happens are what the card says. Um, sometimes you lose stuff. Sometimes you get penalties. Sometimes you lose levels. But you can't be less than level one. But it looks like there may also be instances that you can actually die. Um, and it says here, if you die, you lose all your stuff. 
Once you have died, you don't have to run away from any remaining monsters. You keep your rolls, drives, and level, and any persistent curses on you. Your new character will look just like your old one. If you have driven or critical roll, keep those as well. At this point, you may choose to play as a different character by swapping character card for another one not in use. So that's a really cool thing about uh, this, like think of something like Talisman, you lose absolutely everything on your person, is if something happens in the game that says you die, um, you lose all of your stuff, like all of your items and any cards and, and characters and, and, I mean, guest stars, but you don't lose who you are as a person. So you'll still keep your level, if I was level four, and my drive and my roll. I would just lose everything else. And at that point, I can keep my level and my drive and my roll and choose to be another character if I want thematically, but uh, those are, are persistent. Looting the body. Um, and this is after you die. Lay out your hand beside the cards you had in play, except the cards listed below. If you have an item attached to a cheat card, separate those cards. Starting with a player with the highest level, everyone else chooses one card. In case of ties and level, roll a die. Looted cards go into players' hands. Once everyone gets one card, discard the rest. Dead characters cannot receive cards for any reason, not even charity, and cannot go up level or win the game. At the beginning of the next player's turn, you are no longer dead and your character, new character appears and can help others in combat with your level, character ability, roll, and drive, but you have no cards unless you receive charity or gifts from other players. So if there's stuff in the game that makes you die, that's what happens. Thematically, your character dies. I would say you would give yourself another character, but you keep your level, your roll, and your drive, and you just lost everything else. And when you die, you reach out your hand, and people can loot your body from your hand. One, everyone can take one card. That's pretty cool. Thematic. I like it. At the start of your next turn, you draw four face-down cards from each deck, and you basically start the game over again to try to catch up. But what's cool is you start the game over again to try to catch up, but you still keep your level. So when you die... Thematically, you, you get different cards, a different identity, but you're still your same place in the game. And how you win the game is being level 10. So if I died at 4 and someone else was at level 9, I could still say, oh, I'm still level 4. So otherwise, that'd be way too punishing. If you die, like, why would you play the game? Which is the problem with, like, Talisman, for example. Whereas this, you could say, like, oh, if you die, you have another chance, but as another character. Cool. All right, so now I'm going to show you example combat. Okay, okay, combat, which you kind of already did. Um, I also want to do this example that it shows. All right. So this example, it says you're playing as not the brave, and you're level three. And you have... You have knocked over a critical roll. Congratulations. <clears throat> All right. You have not brave level three. You have Maelstrom, Maelstrom Gloves, Step of the Wind, Elven Chain, Yezo Bernardo, and you are a fighter. So that brings your... Uh, To a total strength of 12, and let's say you're fighting a Hydra. This example I'm talking about. Level 3, fighting Hydra, you're a fighter, you have Yezza, Elven Chain, Step the Wind, Maelstrom Gloves. 
<clears throat> um, there's an alternate way. Shoot. I did guess. We do have to talk about alternate ways you can play right quick. All right, so this is the battle center situ situation. We'll get back to that. Circle back. So there are alternate ways, uh, uh, optional roles they add to the game to make it feel more like you're playing actually in critical role, which I like. One is the identity. That's pretty cool. But they have that core role change, but that was pretty cool. Another optional role is you can only win the game once a total of three boss monsters have been defeated. So what that means is uh, to win the game, to start the end game, you, someone can't win at level 10 until three bosses have been killed. Therefore, if somebody races to get to 10, uh, you can still catch up to try to get to level 10 too. And then if, if you kill three bosses, you have then essentially would be a, a tie unless someone then has more treasure than somebody else. Meaning the value of your gold that's out. All right, so let me find, see if I can find an example of a boss monster. And how do you know it's a boss monster? Okay, I think how you know it's a boss monster is if there's a spider in the left corner. I think that's what it is. Yeah. So for example, here's Demon Knight Otath. You know it's a boss monster because you see the spider in the lower left. Whereas normal monsters, you're not seeing that. That's that's I denote something as a boss monster. Um another another option rule, which I think is the best one, is when everyone has added all the bonuses they're going to add, you have to roll a D20. So it's like you're playing fifth edition. And so you roll a d20 for yourself and for the, I should just read it. The active player rolls a d20. When everyone has added all the bonuses, the active player rolls a d20. In this case, I rolled a three. If you roll a one, it's a critical failure and you lose the fight regardless of what you have on you. If you roll a 2 to 19, you add that math to your strength. If you roll a 20, it's a critical hit, and it's an automatic victory. That's pretty cool. It, it's also pretty bad, but it, it adds excitement. I like it. The player to the active player's right also rolls the d20 and adds that for the monster. So uh, the thing I would have done here is it was really a loss that you didn't just add two dice to this game. Because, you know, if you have multiple players, or even like combining, then it's like, this way it's not memory. You could say, I rolled 11. You have some way to remember, and someone else can roll a different number, and then you can compare the totals instead of saying, wait, what it was the total? But I like this idea of rolling d20 to see what happens. Um, so when the monster rolls, there's no critical effects that just adds the value. You can only have a critical miss or a critical success for the active player. Um, now the active player may consult with their helper. If two of them play one more card, If that card would change the result of the combat either by beating the monster directly, by removing a monster... I should have read the slip. Now that the active player... Now, God, English. Now the active player may consult with their helper, if any. So you, could, you, you, get, you do all the modifiers. Then you roll your d20. And then you or your helper can play one more card to try to overcome... If the card would change the result of the combat either by beating the monsters directly, by removing a monster from the combat to leave the monster combat strength too low to win, or of course by canceling the whole combat somehow. 
The other players may not respond to that card. If it ends the combat successfully, it is legal to play. If not, it goes back to the owner's hand. So, again, how this option rule works is you do you do munch kick combat as normal. And then when it would be the end, instead, you then also roll d20 for both. And then you or the helper can play one more card. No other one, no one else at the table can interrupt that final phase of combat. Only during the normal uh, combat phase. So that's pretty cool. All right, so I'm gonna review again. I'll, I'll do a review at the end. All right, so now we'll get back in combat. So for this example here, uh, my strength is a 12. The height of strength is an eight. And let's say I roll the die. And let's say that that value was a four for the sake of argument. Then that means now Knot's total strength is 16. And let's say the Hydra rolled a 10. Then the Hydra's total level is an 18. So then it's 16 to 18. I lose. I then have to try to run away to avoid the bad stuff. Um, if I do, no bad stuff happens. If I don't, bad stuff happens. And again, you have to roll a uh, d6, and you have to get a what or better. Let me review. Let me review. I can do that too, to review. What the fuck is it? Running away. Where are you? You have to roll a, f uh, a five or better to run away. And that's example. Like, comments pretty straightforward. It's basically, you, you're just reading cards, comparing total values. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. So to review again, as far as when you do stuff, um, when you could take actions, at any time you could discard a roll, play a go up a level or guest star, or play a curse. You can take actions at any time as long as you're not in combat. I, I'm sorry, at any time as long as you're not in combat, you can trade items, you can change which items you have equipped, and you can play cards you've received, as long as you're not in combat. And when it's your turn, you can play a new role, you can sell items for levels, and you can play an item. And to review one more time, interfering with combat, you can use a one-shot item You can play a monster enhancer, or you can add a monster from your hand by using Wandering Monster, or you can curse them. And that's the game in a nutshell. Well, I did not expect the stream to go as long as it did, but there was a lot of explanation to honestly a very easy to play game. Honestly. The game, again, is just kick open the door. Fight the monster, compare values. You could also roll that d20 at the end to add some spice. And then if you lose, you run away, try to. Otherwise, bad stuff happens. If you win, grab the treasure. If you kick open the door and you don't get a monster, you then uh, can uh, look for trouble, play a card from your hand, or you can loot the room and take a card into your hand. And that is Munchkin Critical Role. Um, like, I'm not a huge fan of the Munchkin system because I think it's more kind of like party game-ish with some strategy. So it's kind of like blurring the lines there, I guess, is what makes it unique. But I'm more into strategy games. But I just think it's a really cool game to play, especially with friends. I just want to play out an experience as the Mighty Nine, which is really cool. 
Well, thanks for watching, everybody. If uh, you like what you saw, please subscribe, like, and comment on Twitch, Twitter, or YouTube. And uh, again, this is Ismorta. I'll catch you next time.